Hello everybody, welcome to a special edition of the Gamers Podcast where we are focusing on some live conferences. I'm joined today by Eric Schweitzer. Hello. And Andrew King. Hello. Uh, Eric has spent the last week at GDC for us and Andrew has been at PAX East. Uh, They're both quite different conferences. GDC is mainly developers going and talking to developers, doing different uh, presentations on how their games were built. So a lot of the things that Eric's uh, been seeing, you've already seen on the site. Things like uh, Larian saying they're not going to make another Baldur's Gate. That came from GDC. Whereas at PAX, that's a lot more hands-on, a lot more games to see, a lot more developer interviews. So Eric's done some of that, but he'll mainly be focusing on the developer side of things. Whereas for Andrew, got a hands-on quite a few different games. Why don't you kick us off with that, Andrew? Yes, so I did. I saw quite a few games at uh, PAX East. If you don't know, PAX East is more public facing, I would say, than GDC. So it's a pretty busy show floor. So, you know, you go in and then there's all these booths set up. Probably, you know, hundreds of games split up between, you know, video games and physical games. And public can sort of wander from booth to booth and stand in lines for those. And I had appointments. I was in between those all all week from Thursday to Sunday. Um, so I can talk about some of the cool things I saw, if you'd like. Yeah, let's get some of the big standout, some of the... I know there's some new games out. Kind of had what revealed, basically, at PAX, or shown off for the first time to press and public. Yeah, I was excited to see uh, Rugrats Adventures in Gameland. <laughs> I'd play that too. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when that was announced last year, I was like, well, this is my most anticipated game for 2024, <laughs> um, which was partially from, you know, Rugrats nostalgia and partially because 2023 was super busy and 2025 is a little technically busy. But this year at that time was not looking like it would be especially busy. So a Rugrats game could easily rise to the top. Um, but what I played of it is pretty cool. The developer that I spoke to um, from... Mix Games, I believe, is the name of the developer who is working with Limited Run on this. It uh, began as a game they were making for NES. And so you can play all of the game in like an 8-bit style that looks, I don't know, maybe it might just be because Tommy's head is so round and hairless, but it <laughs> reminded me a lot of Bonk. Looked a lot like the the Bonk uh, <laughs> games, um, so you can play those in two D. But then, like you know, sort of like the Halo remasters that three four three did for Xbox yeah. a while ago, you can switch at any moment and play in HD, which just looks like the exactly like the cartoon, exactly like you're playing the cartoon. It's funny that they um, call it HD mode. Because it's yeah. a completely different art style. It's it's yeah, not it's like they round different. off the edges or anything. It's just no. it goes from eight bit video game to hand drawn cartoon. But it's like right now you're playing in HD. <laughs> right, and it's kind of it's kind of jarring too because the original is like you know boxy square, like you're playing it on a CRT. And then when you switch, and there is like a CRT mode, so you can have like the scan lines and stuff. And then when you switch to the new one, it's fully widescreen. So it just looks like, you know, two completely different eras of video games. But the developer I spoke to said the code underneath is exactly the same because they built the old looking version completely originally and then decided just to add this, you know, hand drawn looking version. So it's the same code base underneath, but completely different visuals and like completely different presentation, even in terms of like aspect ratio. Yeah. That's so that I was cool. Big, uh, when when we did um, the Tomb Raider collection, that was something I had a big issue with. Like, you can switch between the old and the new style, but the new style is just the old style, but it doesn't look so crappy. Um, uh, it sounds yeah. like this is a much better way of doing that. One thing I really right. like. One thing I really liked about it was when you are in the eight bit and it's the square aspect ratio. You can have art on the sides. And, yeah. the, and the art changes for every single environment that you're in. Mm, they did. I didn't notice that. Yeah, I, I missed yeah. that. Yeah, I played most of it in the HD and sort of switched to the um, retro style just to sort of get, you know, 
just sort of, to sort of see it. We had Gabrielle Castagna, a specialist at the site, doing video for us, and so she was sort of capturing over my shoulder, and so we got like the transition from uh, the HD to the retro. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely would play most of my time in the HD because it looks so much like the cartoon. So that hits my nostalgia much more than the retro, although the retro does look more like a game you would have played in the 90s. It feels uh, terrible in like the best way. <laughs> like it, feel, <laughs> it feels like the most dated NES like crap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. the <laughs> platformer like uh like the obstacles is like a snake that like shoots at you and you like can't jump over it because it's so hard to move your stupid baby uh. body like <laughs> it's so hard and it feels so terrible to play and i love it yeah it really is like a throwback to like that very stiff kind of uh 90s platformer yeah it's like was... ducktales yes they cited that as an inspiration for it um, I was talking to one of the developers who I'm forgetting his name right now, but he's like the lead developer on the game. And he said that the Disney afternoon collection was a big inspiration for how the game looks and feels. And I can definitely see that or hollow Knight If you want a more sort of modern equivalent, that game also listeners. So, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> game also sort of has that, I don't know, hollow Knight. I think that was part of the reason I didn't click with it was because it has a very sort of stiff feel to it and the way that those older platformers did. I'm trying to remember what the original Regrets game was like because there was a Regrets platformer for, I think, the PlayStation 1. It's probably for other systems as well, but I, I think I had it on the PlayStation 1. It was something about Reptar, possibly Reptar's Revenge. I might be getting that mixed up with Spyro. I, I know that was a Reptar. I 100%ed oh, yeah. that game multiple times. I was... At, if you 100% that game, at the end, you play uh, a level as Reptar stomping through the city, and then he puts on a top hat and gets a cane and does like a... Yes, oh, I must dance. have done that. I remember that. I do remember yeah. playing as Reptar, yeah. Um, okay, I, do, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about um, right, this yeah, regret game that you both think is kind of terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eric, I know a lot of the things that you've seen. You just can't talk about that they're, they're embargoed for a long, long time. GDC, because it's yeah. not fan-facing, um, tends to have much longer embargoes, and sometimes they don't have any expiration on the embargo. They're just going to show right. you a cool thing and say you can't talk about this ever. Um, what were some cool things that you can talk about? Is there anything? Yeah, I, uh, I went to the mix... Uh, which is like uh, the the Media Indie Exchange. It's like a separate uh, event that you'll see pop up around Summer Games Fest yeah. and um, other stuff. And all that stuff that I played, I can talk about. Um, the I think the coolest thing I got to play there was uh, Hyperlight Breaker. Okay. Uh, the sequel to Hyperlight Drifter, but not really. Uh, because if you played Hyperlight Drifter, that is a like a isometric mostly linear uh like actiony hades kind of thing uh it's cool it's a really good twitchy uh action game this one is uh a pivot it is a 3d roguelike so much like the original risk of rain was like a 2d game and then risk of rain 2 was a 3d roguelike honestly this is just risk of rain 2 but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, no, that's a good game. No, yeah, it's, I think that's a great game. It's uh, it's three player co op. Um, it is character based, uh, and then you have some customization with, like, so they each character has like their own like gear and stats, but then you have like essentially badges that you can like mix and match to adjust their stats that you'll collect and uh as your upgrades so then you go into kind of a procedurally generated open world and then there's three mini bosses you you go around the world collecting upgrades beating those three mini bosses that unlocks the the boss you beat the boss you go to the next stage it sounds like i've just described risk of rain 2 but it's called hyper light breaker um and it's cool. It, I mean, it feels really tight. Uh, the the fir Hyperlight Drifter does too. So like, there is some carry over there. But it's it is very interesting that they just went like, oh, we have this like beloved hit indie, you know, isometric game. 
let's make risk of rain too because that works like yeah. <laughs> right. how does it work on with the characters because i i know gdc is all about like discovering the secrets behind games and how they all come together and how exactly games are miracles and i'm speaking here with no real knowledge <laughs> on how games work but i always feel like when i play a roguelite that has multiple characters so much effort goes into making each character different that it feels like more time should have been spent on making the game good Mm. Most of the mm. my favorite roguelites, all of them really, tend to have very strong. I mean, we just mentioned Hades. I know you love Returnal. Mm -hmm. There's a one character who kind of carries that, and the game is built around them. And I, I think a lot of the indie arcade games that have like 17 different characters to choose from, I, I always think you should just pick your best one and it, gone from there. Yeah, it's interesting because those almost feel like two different genres of roguelites. Yeah, because there, there's a lot of great like Vampire Survivors has a billion characters and yeah. Binding Binding of Isaac. Like it's kind mm. of it's less about like a character and more about like your starting loadout. Yes. So, yeah, you, so you're choosing like which loadout you want to start with, uh, basically. So, yeah, that, that's what they're going for. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was cool. I also played uh, this game called Rugrats at the mix. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> um. So, yeah, so like you were saying, like, I, I had so many meetings and so many previews and demos and meeting with publishers, and I'm not allowed to talk about any of it, which is so strange for, for us, because we cover stuff like PAX and Comic-Con and Summer Games Fest, and everybody wants us to talk about their games. Uh, but at GDC, they don't want us to talk about their games. They just want to... <laughs> They just wanted to say hi to press and like keep this on your radar. But um, the things I can talk about is the the panels and the award shows. Yeah, the panels are really interesting to me because a lot of panels at the more fan facing ones they tend to be like Comic Con, like conventions. They they have the voice actors right. there most of the time. They're very like they talk about different memes and fan art and how much they they love the community and I think that's really important. I, I do think it's important to cultivate that in gaming. But the pack stuff, the GDC stuff, sorry is really specific there were a couple that i know you were in that just went way over my head some of them, some of them were really oh, yeah. interesting but some of them were so hyper technical oh what's that yeah. like like being there as opposed because we got the highlights from you but you're sat in it for you know an hour or more sometimes it's like i'm really not supposed to be there <laughs> you know it's like i've <laughs> snuck into this like well a lot of them feel like lectures at like a video game school yeah um it reminded me because like i went to vfs which has a huge game program and i had a lot of friends in the game program so i would be in their lectures sometimes and it felt like that like um listening to how games are made for an audience of other people that make games and me being like can <laughs> can you please say something that can be a headline but it's not <laughs> a lot of it is not like that at all but those were a lot of those were my favorite ones just because like it's just so cool to learn about really intricate details of how games are made and more and more than that the thought process of how games are made how things that are like technical and complicated how that flows down to the end user experience cuz everything they do is like but how are people going to experience Play it this? yeah you know so like um Man, I sat in some really cool ones. Like I one was um the um the weapons designer for The Last of Us 2, but more specifically, mm. not not like the models of the weapons, the physics of the weapons. Right. Mm. Um and most of the talk was about like the arc and parabola and trajectory of arrows when you fire them from a from the mm. bow. <laughs> that was like there, it was like a half hour of like how do you make an arrow fly? Wow. It, and it was fascinating. So the secret is what I learned is when when uh, you fire the bow and arrow on the last host two, it actually fires three arrows at the exact mm -hmm. same time. One of them fires from Ellie's perspective, like the character actually firing the arrow. Yeah. One of them fires from the camera's perspective because your camera's mm -hmm. over her shoulder. It's yeah. floating, right? And then a third one fires from that same camera perspective, but it's only checking collision if it would hit a rock or a tree branch or something. So so it fires three arrows at once from all those different angles. And then the only one you see is the one that actually hits where the target oh. is. Mm. Right? Because the 
because the the takeaway was like if you have a target reticle on the screen that is where the damage must go like in the mm. to your player they they see the target that's where it has to hit so they have the arrow come from all these different directions to make sure that if ellie is behind is on a corner and realistically wouldn't be able to shoot through that corner but the camera is off and can see around the corner that when you fire that arrow the arrow actually hits the target yeah Mm. that's interesting that is something that i do not just in last of us but in a lot of third person games you kind of go to the to the edge of the wall and you lean and you're not really leaning around the wall but you can see around the wall so you shoot anyway um it's you just kind of think it's just gonna yeah that, that's magic that just happens like you don't yeah. really think about the thought process and, the, and the what goes into that i uh i would be remiss not to talk about my beloved midnight suns yes uh <laughs> because uh i had a, a an amazing panel about how the combat was designed for midnight suns and on the on that same topic if you if your hand is unplayable uh, meaning like you have all hero, all they all cost heroic points and you don't have enough heroic points to play any of your cards. When you redraw, it will not pull the card from the top of your deck. It will mm. give you a playable card every oh, time. Wow. And I, yeah, and I was like, no, I wish I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, But that Midnight Suns panel was so cool because uh, it was talking about how they started from uh, XCOM and created uh, Midnight Suns, but how they learned to do the opposite of XCOM in so many ways. Mm. So it's like XCOM's combat is um, predictable actions with unpredictable outcomes. Because there's mm. you have your percentage chance, but you yep, know yep. every character has these are the things they can do. Yep. So you they're fixed. Whenever they and, in control, they're gonna do that thing. Yeah. And then you have an and then you have an unpredictable outcome, meaning they it might miss or you know, yep. whatever. And then Marvel Sun uh, Midnight Suns is the exact opposite because mm. you're drawing your actions from a deck. So you have unpredictable actions, but the outcomes are fixed. There's no like percent to hit. Like if you do a thing, yeah, that's exactly what little, what happens. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I thought that that was so fascinating because they're like, because Mar- apparently Marvel came to them and said, "We love XCOM. Will you do Marvel XCOM?" Mm. That is interesting because I, I feel like some of the some of the Marvel games just haven't really got a lot of promotion. This was definitely one of them. I think there's probably going to be people listening to this who don't have much of an inkling of what it is, and it's it's strange that this would be something that Marvel would go out and yeah, couldn't really, um, and then. I know it was advertised at the time. I know it would be on sale. I know it's been in the games with gold or the um, PlayStation Plus version of that. I can't remember what it's called. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's always seemed like it's never really got its due Midnight Suns. I know. It's yeah, a bummer too because it, it, uh, part of it is release window, right? Because it came out in December, December after yeah. a lot of sites had put out their, like, game of the year already like i feel like if that game had come out the game awards as well yeah yeah if that game had come out in august i feel like when nothing else was coming or like picked a picked a window where there was very little coming out and had time to build steam i feel like it could have been a bigger hit because it's great it's just like i didn't pick it up until the beginning of 2023 because of how late in the year it launched and Mm -hmm. it's just a bummer because it yeah it is one of the best of the marvel games that i played like it's that and spider-man the Spider-Man series for me that are sort of a, a notch above everything else they put out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's interesting you're saying like, um, you know, going to these, these panels and about the headlines because a lot of times when I'm doing interviews, I don't really care about getting a headline. Like, you know, I want one. I don't, you know, I want to be able to make it interesting. But my favorite interviews that I can think that I've done both at like Gamescom or uh, over the internet or wherever I've been... They haven't necessarily been ones where I've got a one sentence killer. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, when you were in the Baldur's Gate thing, and they said we're not making any more Baldur's Gate, right. that was obvi- that was obviously going to be the headline from that immediately. Yeah. But sometimes I think it, it is more interesting to just have the space to dive into the the smaller stuff, and uh, GDC is probably the best place for that. I think it's it's just so beneficial as someone who write about writes about games, you know, just to like get. A, a perspective and hear how how developers talk about them. I 
think yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I think it's just really valuable to to because we we write about developers as much as we write about games you know and and it is really useful to be able to write in their language when when possible yeah yeah it's interesting because i feel like gdc and pax you're sort of getting opposite experiences in some ways because Mm -hmm. at gdc you're talking about how you're getting these long panels where you're talking about uh you know very specific things i feel like the last of us might have had like a panel a couple years ago where they just talked about how they did the shattering glass mechanic on like how you can break car windows and like Mm. store windows as you walk around Seattle and like you're talking about with the bow and arrow and how that is just laser focused on that one topic and PAX East is like they're giving you like the quickest dirtiest pitch of what their game is like five minutes here's everything you need to know about our game there's no time for like the little nuances. Like you might ask a follow up that prompts that, but they are in pitch mode more than they are in, I don't know, explicate mode. They're not like trying to explain like the depths of their game. They're trying to give you the highest level of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think it's probably time to like bounce back to the packs because it's really fun to talk about things that don't get headlines. But uh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully, we have a headline we can put on this video, and um, that isn't yeah. just here's how the arrows work. <laughs> There's three of them. Um, give, give give us a non regrets game that you loved from uh, PAX. Well, I got to see Visions of Mana. This is when is this coming out? Can I talk about this? Uh, Friday. Okay, that is the 29th. Visions of Mana's embargo till the 28th, so we're good. <laughs> um, yes, I got to play Visions of Mana, and I got to talk to. Oyamada, who's the longtime uh, producer on the series. Uh, just a second, I want to get his first name. Uh, Masaru, Masaru Oyamada. I talked to him about uh, the demo that I played in the series. And so during that, we got to play through two different areas of the game. They put us first in a place called Fallow Step, which is like a sort of wide open field kind of area. And they frustratingly only gave us about 15 minutes there. So like (laughs) you could have spent like a few hours, I'm sure, exploring everything that was there. And I really just got to scratch the surface of that. But it did give me a sense of how the game is going to play and how exploration is going to work. Um, The game that it actually weirdly reminded me of was Super Mario Odyssey. Because as soon as I got out into the field, I looked up on top of like this thatched roof of a house that was near the entrance, and I could see something glowing up there. And I was like, this is like an RPG. I probably can't like jump up and see what's up there. But yeah, you have a double jump, you have an air dash. So you can like, I like jumped up there and found like a little collectible. And those are like scattered all throughout the world. So it really encourages you to like, go off the beaten path and like use your traversal abilities more than I tend to expect from this sort of RPG. I think a little bit like myself, you are a novice at the the Visions games. I know they've got Mm. got quite a big following at the site, but uh, I've never played them. I don't think you'd ever played them before we'd gone. How... How was that as, I guess, an outsider? Because these games tend to be marketed very heavily towards people who are well aware of the series, the aesthetics, what do I expect? But obviously they need some willing to get new players involved as well. Right. Yeah, it's hard to tell where in the game this demo was pulled from. So I'm not sure how much it does like introduce you to the characters, but that was something that I was like trying to get my head around was like who the characters were that I was um traveling with and like who which voices go with which characters because basically all of the voices sounded like they could go with any of the characters one of the people was like really had a really deep voice and it took me forever to figure out that it was like the really twinky cat boy that had the really deep voice which surprised me (laughs) um so yeah his name is morley and he's a cat boy and he's got like the deepest voice and uh then there's Karina, who is like a southern belle, and then you play as Val, I think is the name of the character. Um, so it took me a while to sort of understand the dynamics, but in terms of like gameplay, it's very easy to pick up. It feels instantly intuitive, and like um, that element was easy to pick up. It's it's very 
anime, and so people that like bounce off yeah. of that stuff are gonna bounce off this, I would say, because like we're five minutes into talking about this, and I've said Catboy, so like that gives you a sense <laughs> of you know what to expect from yeah, it. Yeah, these are the vibes that we're that we're looking for here. Yeah, but like from a gameplay perspective, yeah, really easy to pick up and play, and it has that sort of immediate reward loop because you can you know see these. Uh, collectibles and pick those up so it gives you something to constantly be doing that feels good so that was uh, easy but then like story wise as somebody who has not played these games I was it was all sort of over my head which may be a function of it being a demo called from the middle of the game as much as anything yeah. so I don't know I'm not I'm not 100% sure yet I'd have to play more to to really know I want to bounce back to Eric in a second but I am just you've used the example twice now so I just want to just get from you what was the game you played at pax that was the least like any mario game because both <laughs> games so far oh yes. remember this mario game it's a, bit, a little bit like this oh the one that i played that was least like a mario game is link to um which is a circuit building game um so it starts very simple where you have like uh you know basically a start and a finish and you have to figure out how to build a circuit from yeah like mario maker exactly yeah like mario (laughs) maker um it it reminded me of i never played these but the way people talk about them is the i think zachtronics is the name of the studio that makes them okay where they're they're just like machine building games basically you have to be you have to build something that functions and that was sort of like that it's like layering on increasingly complicated mechanics and you have to figure out how to get the electricity from point a to point b i basically every day at pax i played the most mentally taxing thing last which is not (laughs) what you want to do but that (laughs) is what i played this at like five o'clock i started the demo at five o'clock and was just like oh my gosh i can't do this there was luckily a very a very nice uh, pr person there who like when I when he could tell I was stuck, came over and basically told me what to do. But at a, a certain point, I had to tap out because it was just too much for my brain. But if you are well rested, you just had your coffee, <laughs> that would be a really fun game to play. There's nothing like uh, Mario. Yeah. Well, I, I commend you for not going the easy route of picking a really dark shooter. And uh, yeah, yeah. When I was at Gamescom, I did um, post trauma last mm. um, it was last mm. of the last day as well and there's a there's a puzzle in the game where there's two clocks and they've got red hands and blue hands and you just have to add up the numbers of the, the blue hands and the red hands like two o'clock and then half six and you have like and i was just staring at it for ages and i just couldn't figure it out and yeah. the guy was like oh, it's just like six plus two <laughs> and i had to think for a second yeah. about what what is six plus two yeah because <laughs> you're just so <laughs> drained after these days yeah yeah um, so i it's... no i i feel that yeah yeah it's sort of surprising how drained you feel after that i guess it's just hopping into so many different things that you have to learn quickly and then do but yeah you feel completely mentally drained after after that uh yeah so eric do you see anything fun (laughs) anything like Uh, mario or perhaps not like mario yeah uh well let me talk about the uh the award ceremony oh yeah of course yeah so there's two award shows there's the independent game festival awards and the game dev con awards and they do them as one they do independent games first and then immediately begin game dev con um and so there are a couple of really interesting things about the independent game festival awards uh one is that the award winners i had heard of almost none of them uh in part because most of them are not yet released so they were mm. things being shown or uh, at GDC, uh, and then they were giving awards to games that aren't out yet, which is cool. <laughs> but uh, mm. uh, good for discoverability, I guess. So I want to touch on just a couple of those that looked really interesting. First of all, the the grand prize, the thirty thousand dollar prize, went to Venba. Oh, uh, actually, I didn't. I knew Venba won. Actually, I didn't realize it was a prize attached. I thought it was just kind of a gimmick award, like yeah, you know, some of the other things. That that's that's a cool that's a cool award. Um, between the GDCAs and this, Venba won quite a few um, that night. Um, the have you new- played Venba? Just so for people who maybe don't know it, I have. But have you played just in like anything? a preview, just as like a sample? Okay, I played yeah. the whole thing. I-, I think we discussed this election. We did the the gamer races. It's not something that I 
hugely connected to. Yeah. Um, but I know a lot of people who really, really did. Um, just for people who are wondering kind of what Vember is, I guess, is the point of this discoverability. Mm -hmm. Vember actually is it. It came out last year, so you can go and get that now. Um, it's basically a cooking sim, but the point of it is not to cook the dishes. It's uh, as you go through the different foods, there is a, a Tamil boy who lives mm -hmm. in Canada and he basically grows apart from his culture and heritage wants to kind of fit in. Um, his dad gets beaten up at one point for looking foreign. Um, his mom can't get a job because she's got an accent, all these sorts of things. And it's through cooking that he really rediscovers, I guess, his love of his uh, family culture and connects with his, with his mother. So it's a, it's a cooking sim that it has a narrative and not just in a kind of, we need to win the bake off kind of way, but in a, there's a real story to it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I guess it didn't resonate too well for me, but I'm glad that one. Uh, sorry, Eric, just uh, yeah. to let people know about why that game won what it is. Why it yeah. Um, so they have an award called the Nuovo Award. It's like the award for innovation. Yeah. Uh, and that went to Anthology of the Killer, uh, which is actually a series. So uh, there are nine of the killer games. Uh, these are like itch freeware yeah, okay. games. Um, and it is a, they are 3D adventure horror games with the, this like extremely sloppy MS paint art style. Mm. Uh, they are very like old flash game vibe. Um, and I haven't played them, but they're all free on itch. The first one's called voice of the killer. And then I think there's like nine of them after that. Um, but, uh, yeah, check that out. If you like really <laughs> niche horror stuff, it looks pretty <laughs> cool. Um, excellence in visual arts went to a game called Phonopolis, which is not yet out. Never heard of it. Uh, uh it is a, um, uh, it's sort of an isometric platformer kind of game. It's a very story focused thing about, uh, a kid who is the only person that sees the rise of fascism happening around him. Okay. Um, pretty timely piece. Uh, Excellence in Audio is another unreleased game, but it has a it's early access. It's called Rhythm Doctor, and it is just rhythm heaven in a hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it looks very charming. Um, the Excellence in Design. Uh, this game won a couple of awards. It's called Crypt Master. Uh, it comes out May 9th, and it has a demo on Steam. It is a old school dungeon crawler, like a kind of like a Grimrock kind of thing, uh, but it's a typing game. Mm. Uh, so you're you're typing in the actions to fight and search and everything um but I it has kind of a thing free yeah go ahead i think meg played that x egx or was or something last year that that typing to fight brings yeah. back i remember meg telling me a game like that if uh if she did then we'll have a preview on the site and i'll send eric and if uh, she didn't then we'll cut this bit from the video so it won't matter i think it's it's not so much like a ty typing game in the sense that like it's like a lot of typing games are about how accurate and quickly can you type this is more of like uh, solving puzzles by typing. Yeah, the right no, words. that sounds like it. Yeah, you have to find the right word. I'm, sh I'm yeah, getting close and close. I think, and this was the game. Uh, so that was excellence in design. Uh, excellence in narrative was Mediterranea Inferno, which I know nothing about. Uh, Audio award went to Ram Random Access Mayhem, which is a student game, mm, okay. uh, which I thought was cool. It, it's a uh, roguelike. And then the coolest award is called the Alt Control GDC, uh, which is um, all games with uh, bespoke controls, like uh, like an input that is not just a keyboard and mouse or a controller. They have to invent mm -hmm. something for their okay. game. Uh, and so this category, they have like twelve. It was a. It's like a class of all of these video game inventors and they showed this really cool reel of all their different types of games where it's like one was like you sit on a toilet and you hold a plunger and you move the plunger back and forth to like <laughs> ski down a hill it's all like wild stuff like that um they <laughs> the winner was a game called chumo 
Okay. Uh, that's C H U M O. Uh, and what exactly was it? It's like um, it's like uh, it's like an escape room, like an interactive escape room. It's really hard to explain all these inputs, but it's like yeah, it's. It's like a virtual interactive escape room. It's called the Exorcist Exams. Um, okay. I didn't get a chance to do it. I wish I could have. Um, but uh, yeah, it looked fascinating. The The thing about the Independent Game Awards, the, every single uh, recipient used their speech, and they had a lot of time uh, compared, to, <laughs> compared to the Game Awards. They had a lot of time up there. Uh, every single one of them used their time to call out uh, injustice. Mm. Uh, it was a incredibly hostile uh, environment in a in a very like necessary way. So it, mm. it was either about the state of the game industry and the layoffs, the um, the lack of visibility for these kinds of games, like the way that the the um, platform holders, um, you know, don't do anything to elevate anything but the most high-profile AAA biggest budget games. Um, people talking about Gaza, people talking about capitalism. Like every single speech was a call out, <laughs> uh, and it, it was amazing. That like, yeah, the vibes are incredible. And then the pivot from that to the. GDC awards, which was just giving a bunch of AAA games more awards, like the vibe shift was palpable. Mm, you know, yeah. like that's when, like, you know, Nintendo would get up on stage to accept their Zelda awards and just be like, we love the players. Thank you for this. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye. Mm. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. It was uh, the, the mood was really interesting. Um, the host of the GDC awards, Alana Pierce. Did, did a great job. Tried to keep that hostile energy going. Um, just to say, like, we're all here to celebrate games that made billions while developers en masse lost their livelihoods. Uh, there was a lot of that. Um, the GDC Awards was a, a lot of stuff you would predict. Hi-Fi Rush won Best Audio. Baldur's Gate 3 won almost everything. Uh, Vemba won best debut. Um, was, was this where Sven Vinky had his, uh, where he said something about, uh, I don't know, capitalism so, or injustice of yeah. mega corporations or so something? Th yeah. So this is interesting. So, so we had already gone through the whole uh, independent game foundation awards or fest awards, and every single, like I said, every single person got up and said. F the man, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then we get to the GDC awards and it's a lot more sterile, but then Sven gets up to accept uh, uh, one of the narrative awards or something. And he's like, I wasn't supposed to accept this. One of our writers was, but they couldn't be here. So now I'm here. I don't know what to say. Everything that I wanted that I would have said has already been said. Um, but, you know, I've been in this business a long time and I've been fighting publishers for a long time. And it's and it's just so disappointing to see this cycle repeated and to see uh, all these big studios lose their institutional knowledge because they can't keep these uh, these people that really know what to do on the staff. And it, and it doesn't have to be this way. And so he just sort of reiterated what other people said and what other people had said more passionately and stronger and mm. in a more succinct and interesting way. But Sven got all the headlines because he made mm. Baldur's Gate, <laughs> right. you know? So, yeah. so it was, what he said was awesome, but he was just like, everybody else already said this. So I'm going to say it too. Yeah. And I know it's not the first time he said that stuff. It's not like Sven finally took a stand. Like he always talks like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, his speech was sort of the, the least, powerful of all of the the speeches and that yeah. was the one everybody was was talking about mm. I, th I think that's important to names I, I know we kind of joked before about like we don't always care about getting a headline it was just nice to kind of sit and watch um them explain how the arrows work in in the last of us but 
you know, the, the reason that we want some of the most senior developers or people like Jeff Keighley to speak about these things isn't because we think Jeff Keighley is going to say it in a more interesting way or because he's mm -hmm. um, more persuasive or because even because we think he will actually change things by doing it, it's because he is can mount a greater pressure on things, you know? Yeah. So I, I think yeah. it, it's... It's, I guess, risky is probably what I'm looking for. Risky of people like um, Sven to speak out on this. And I, I know right. he can run some companies. It's not quite the same. But, you know, the, the kid who made this student game, like, I'm sure he did very well. I'm sure his speech was very good, whatever. But he doesn't have much to kind of lose by doing that. And that's not mm -hmm. to say he's not brave for doing it or to, to criticize it. I just mean, I do think um, when people of a bigger profile speak out, there's something in that, even if they're not as powerful in terms of what they say on a, on a micro level as the rest of the speakers at the conference, I think on a macro level, because they are able to change headlines and create the news story, it I think it still is, is worth doing. And yeah. having been to some of the other games shows, not even just the game awards, but like the, the Gamescom awards where it's like, most anticipated PC game, Lies of P. It, it does kind of sometimes be like, what's the point in any of this? So it's, right. it's nice that some of GDCs at least has a purpose. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, because you know, there it's like a it's an indie bubble. Like part part of the these people's frustrations is that they are like sort of screaming into the void. And you're right, it is at lower risk for them because they're they're going to continue their little indie lives and work together and scrounge together what they can to make their little indie games. Um, so it, do, it does matter when someone like Sven gets up and says it, uh, even though he himself runs an indie studio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. But it, it was, uh, it was just the award show, you know, like even, even the Oscars, I, I thought it had some pretty powerful moments this year. Um, mm. You know the Zona Interest director speech for one. Hundred percent, yeah. Was this was the the breakout. I think yeah, or the breakout, like the, yeah. the big um, stand that was taken. But but yeah. award shows as a concept are largely completely useless to us. Yeah, pure vanity, you know. Um, but mm -hmm. something like this this uh, Independent Games Fest Awards, where they're giving thirty thousand dollars to the you know the three dudes that made venba or whatever like that that does matter and yeah. like yeah. and giving these people a platform to say like this we love games and we love this industry and yet any everyone with the power to do anything either won't do anything or is actively pushing us out you know like i that does matter like it felt like a, an award show that was really important uh, when award shows sort of categorically are not important. <laughs> right. Yeah, there was a moment, I think it was the Golden Joysticks, where um, so somebody, I think it might actually have been Sven, certainly someone from Baldur's Gate, had said mm -hmm. something about the, the, the layoffs or um, you know, this, this general kind of, not crunching as in the way we mean crunching in, in video games, but crunching, you know, everything being condensed down and people being squeezed out. Yeah. And then the camera cut to the 10 cent table it would just that that morning done a bunch of layoffs, and so I think there there definitely is that moment. You say it's just vanity, but if these people who are essentially taking the glory, so name some of the executives who go there, I think you didn't really have that much input on how this game works or why people yeah. like it. Go there in a suit and go like hold up the awards, and then all through the night, everyone is going to basically saying you suck. That, right. Sometimes it matters just for that reason. Sometimes it's enough to ruin someone's night. Yeah, right. I if I if I w w worked for a publisher, I th like that was a very hostile environment. I, I think yeah. I would have been very uncomfortable to be in there, and that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I played on the last day of PAX was the Divinity Original Sin board game. And that uh, fell into the category that I mentioned before of something I was way too tired to be learning at the time that I was playing it because it was like four o'clock on a on Sunday. Um, but that was really cool and seems pretty gigantic based on what I played of it. Um, 
it comes with a like spiral bound book that's pretty thick, about that thick. Okay. Um, and we played in just one very small <clears throat> area of the game. It's like if you've played Divinity Original Sin 2, it was when you are. We were in a very small part of Fort Joy, which is a big area in the beginning of that uh, that game. Um, and it's not like every page of the notebook is its own game, but we spent an hour just in this one page of this book. And there's probably a hundred other pages like that to play through. So it was pretty um, cool to see that game is very expensive. I think it's on the Larian site for like $250. So, you know, wow. it definitely needs to really deliver. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty cool. And I didn't get to play enough of it to have really a solid take on it as a whole. Um, but it does seem to do a pretty good job of uh, replicating the like status effects of game of the games like Baldur's Gate 3 and of any original Sin 2. Like our enemies got, you know, status effects like you can get in like if you like do water damage in like an area that already has water, it increases the damage and like you can electrocute people if they're already soaked and they'll do more damage. So it is a pretty solid from what I played at least like representation of what that what those games feel like in video game form and board game form. Yeah, so, I do that like cool. that. I do like that PAX has um, a lot more tabletop stuff. I don't know we've done a lot of Comic Con stuff and they have it as well. The conventions mm -hmm. that I've been to um, tend to stick very much to a handful of the most popular card games as opposed to mm -hmm. having any of the kind of other stuff. They might have a, a booth on Magic off a of, of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. Yeah, Larian had a pretty huge presence there, and most of it was people playing Baldur's Gate 3. Um, but they had a big castle um, that they had built pretty close to the escalators that lead down into the show floor. Uh, they had like a nautiloid perched on top. They had a Mind Flayer statue, and then they also had all of the... They had Shadowheart, Lazel, Asterion, and Karlak, and a, and a costumed Mind Flayer. They were all in a costume that were like taking pictures with people throughout the convention so even though they don't really have anything new that's coming out except for the board game which kickstarted a while ago and is like finally i think shipping out to uh, backers um they had a huge presence there that's felt sort of like a victory lap to me you know after the year they've had yeah i think so i think i think that's something that they've they've earned yeah just be there with the, the big um big head of a game and just have some statues and cosplayers right. it's nice to have it yeah. though yeah, it was pretty cool, and uh, they were right next to Path of Exile 2, which also had a castle for its booth, so it was like dueling <laughs> kingdoms across the aisle from each other. A couple things I wanted to touch on. I went to a Nintendo partner event, got to play a bunch of stuff there. Um, I got to play, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Senzura? Uh, a good Tales of Senzura Zhao? Yes, I'm, okay, I'm yes. That. The Tales of, I now know the game you mean, though. I believe it's Tales of Senzara colon Zhao. <laughs> I could be butchering that old thing. <laughs> I should have written down a pronunciation. Uh, this is a Metroidvania uh, heavily inspired by uh, Ori. Uh, mm. I played it with the uh, developer developed by uh, a studio in Africa, which is, which is pretty cool, and and he was uh, very upfront that this was heavily inspired by Ori. Um, what's kind of unique about it is you have these two masks. One mask is blue, and when you wear it, you fire directionally like Samus, pew, pew, fire yeah. blast. And the other mask is red, and then when the red mask is gone, you're melee. And you just tap L1 to swap between the two masks, and so you are sort of fluidly mixing ranged and, and melee in these two combat forms together. And they each have their own special attack, and they have some little different technical things that they do. But it was really fun. It was really fun in combat to you know be constantly switching between these two uh, forms. That, that was sort of a novel thing. And then it has the, like, depth that Ori has in, like, the background where it feels like the world is really massive, even though you're just 
on a 2D plane. Um, that was really cool. Um, I also played Animal Well. Uh, I played Animal Well a couple of years ago. At yeah, Pax. I remember you've been you've been into Animal Well for a, for a while yeah. now. It's great. It's so it's so good. It's like uh, you when you when you look at it, you're like, oh, this looks really unique. You know, nothing really quite. I mean, it's like a pixel art kind of thing, but it has this like neon layered thing to it uh, yeah. that it just looks so cool. Um, but it it's like. Yeah, when you play it, you know it's something special because it's it's just like this really hands-off, non-tutorial, no dialogue, again, Metroidvania, but it's just so exploration-focused, more than more than any other... Um, uh, the most exploration-focused Metroidvania. There's no combat or anything. There's enemies that you have to like avoid and stuff, but it's just like every new space you explore is like, okay, what is this place? Where am I supposed to go? And it's just this, you never lose that feeling of where the heck am I supposed to go next? And I know that's a, definitely going to be a turnoff for some people. Um, they, they want the handholdy directional yeah. quest marker experience and that's fine. This is not that at all. And I think it's, it's very cool. Um, uh, Epic Mickey rebrushed. Oh yeah, uh, beautiful, love it. Mm, I, nice, you, yeah. Did you ever play that? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Angie, you play Epic Mickey? No, it's one of my Warren Spector blind spots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Warren Spector's Epic Mickey. <laughs> uh, I I can't talk much about this. I met Warren Spector. He told me that that was the Wii's second biggest third party game, the wow. first Epic Mickey. What I was never knew ahead that. of it. I wonder. No, no, no. Um, Black Eyed Peas experience. <laughs> uh, Epic Mickey is so good. I it's love it. sh shockingly good, and uh, and this uh, new one they've they uh, actually added some abilities and stuff. I thought it was just going to mm. be a paint job, but um, yeah, dum, dum. yeah. <laughs> uh, what else? Cat the cat life a cat's a cat's journey. <laughs> Come on, somebody help me out here. I feel uh, like you're describing Stray. <laughs> Nintendo uh -huh. Switch cat game. Uh, Little Kitty Big City. Okay. Little Kitty Big City. Still a clue, to, sorry. <laughs> well, we can move on. I think I think it's cute. Another, <laughs> it's another cat game, and I think that's it for Nintendo. Yep. Okay, um, Andrew, you had a Metroid-ish game. I guess they're called Metroidvanias. They're not called Metroid-ish games. They have a specific name. <laughs> um, go ahead. Yeah, I played three, and I want to talk about each very quickly. Um, the first one I played was called Altered Alma, which is a, a 2D Metroidvania that is like the first in that genre that I've played that's really going for like a cool cyberpunk uh, aesthetic. It's like takes place in Neo Barcelona, and you are just looking for a spaceship to get off world, basically. Um, and it did the opposite of what Eric praised Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown for doing, which is that it does not bury its double jump. I got like three <laughs> major <laughs> skills in the space of the half hour demo. I got like the... I got a knife that I could throw into objects that lets me teleport to where I throw it. I got cool. the slide and I got the double jump all within a half an hour. And I don't know Jeez. if that's like a demo thing, if it'll actually be that fast in the game. But if it does, I feel like by the time you finish it, you're going to have like a couple dozen abilities if it keeps that pace up. Hmm. So that was cool. And the background art was really cool. Just a lot of cool like cyberpunky detail. There were like these sort of spider-like robots that were hanging in the background and like picking up crates to move them and um there was a huge holographic ballerina that was like dancing in one area um so that had a really good uh vibe and like very quickly became very fun to play so altered alma check it out whenever it comes out it's coming out later this year i think the other one i played was memories reach which was like a 3d metroidvania that's how the developer described it it reminded me a little bit of like mist or riven or the witness okay. where it's like a first person sort of puzzle game i was in an area that was like circular with multiple like walkways and then elevators in between them and you were trying to line up these lasers so that they all hit a central point and opened it so that you could get a 
power up basically. The only exit is like a Geiger counter starts clicking when you try to walk through it. So you need to get whatever's in the center to get out of there. Um, and this had that as like an overarching big puzzle, but then there were little puzzles that you were solving throughout. And that was an interesting balance. There were like these line circle puzzles where you had to like line up these little hex hexagons within to make a pattern and then that would open paths for you. And then once I had solved all that, I realized that the elevator I took to get down was blocking one of the lasers. So I had to figure out how to redo that basically to get the lasers connected. I got a radioactivity like protection suit and exited the area and it was it was just a very cool demo. I don't feel like there's enough of those like sort of first person, no combat, just puzzles, exploring mm -hmm. a cool world kind of games. So that was fun. Um, and then the third Metroidvania I played was called Lucid, which the developer is calling a Celestroidvania. Okay. Um, yes, because the most like Celesty thing I saw about it was that you like there were like rock walls that you could like boost through, and those gave you like a boost of speed when you went through them. That's quite a big um, sell for you. I know you were you were a big Celeste fan. Yeah, I do. I really like Celeste, and I really like Metroidvanias. Um, I played this. I you, remember this. Yeah, yeah. You're like a little monk guy, and the developer told me that you're basically a Jedi whose order has been Order sixty six, basically, and you and your master are like recovering from that, basically, and like gaining power ups. And so that was cool. I enjoyed uh, what I played of that, and I. I'm eager to play more to see how Celesti it gets as it goes on. But those were the three Metroidvanias I played at the show that were all quite good. The hardest game I played was trying not to get murdered in downtown San Francisco for a week. <laughs> <laughs> that, that city has gone to hell. It is a scary, scary town, I tell you. <laughs> uh, the the San Francisco natives will be like, oh, don't, don't bash San Francisco if you only are there for the convention and you only stay in the worst part of San Francisco. And it's like, I didn't put the convention center there. You know, like <laughs> it, is, it is like a zombie apocalypse. It is very uh, disconcerting. So yeah, if you want some real life terror, go spend a week <laughs> in downtown in the Tenderloin, baby. <laughs> Well, on uh, on that note, I think that just about wraps up our PAX and GDC coverage. So, big takeaway is don't go to San Francisco. <laughs> uh, you can read more of our coverage on GDC and PAX over at the website. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Visit us at thegamer.com. That's the gamer, no spaces.